There's an expression in Africa, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. All over the planet, individuals, groups, and governments are getting together, forming partnerships for peace education. That's the topic of our next session. Willow Baker is an ambassador for the Institute for Economics and Peace, chairperson, Rotary International Peace Builder Club, and program director of the Premroa Watts Foundation video-based peace education program. She is a former professor of specialized English in Paris at the Sorbonne University's Communication and Journalism School. Her peace building has taken her throughout Africa and Europe. She'll be introducing us to a panel of grassroots peace educators. Please welcome Willow Baker. I'd like to introduce our panelists today. It's an honor to join this illustrious panel to explore such a significant topic as peace education. Alberto Ovando Martinez is joining us from Mexico. Alberto is the legal advisor, private secretary, executive secretary of the state public security system in Quitano Row, Mexico. Reverend Canon Petro Sabune is joining us from New York. He's part of the Episcopal Church, an immigrant and refugee advocate, former chaplain at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, and former African Partnership Officer for the Episcopal Church. So I'd like to present the Prem Rawat Foundation's Peace Education Program, which is an innovative so series of video-based workshops that help people discover and develop their own inner strength and personal peace. The program gives participants the opportunity to focus and reflect on their own humanity and their inner resources. Rather than describing or defining personal peace, the program enables individuals to reach their own understanding. The course consists of 10 workshops each based on a particular theme with short video excerpts of renowned author and peace advocate Prem Rawat's inspiring presentations, media interviews, and interactions with a diverse range of audiences. The program focuses on these 10 relevant themes, peace, appreciation, inner strength, self-awareness, clarity, understanding, dignity, choice, hope, and contentment. The content is inclusive, non-sectarian, and non-political. The workshop sessions are designed to promote critical and creative thinking, genuine reflection, and thoughtful discussion, all helping each individual participant develop greater personal awareness and resilience. The course uses a variety of modes to present the content, including animated shorts and music videos that appeal to different learners and learning styles and make the workshops enjoyable and adaptable. The Prem Rawat Foundation provides access to the course materials to organizations free of charge, making the peace education program readily available to diverse populations in more than 70 countries and in over 30 languages. To date, over 175,000 people have benefited from the course. It has proven effective in a variety of situations with various groups, including youth organizations, gangs, high schools, universities, and adult education programs, as well as veteran groups, healthcare settings, senior organizations, homeless shelters with drug rehabilitation and corrections, probation and parole, and in conflict and post-conflict zones. Research studies have shown the cross-cultural success of the program. Regardless of participants' socioeconomic status, gender or culture, the awareness of their inner resources and the possibility of peace increases during the workshop. The peace education program works because it focuses on the person, their humanity, the strengths and qualities common to all human beings. It brings out the good in people. Alberto, would you like to 
um, give your short presentation now, please. Yes, thank you, Willow. It is a pleasure for me to share this panel with all, all of you and talk about education for peace, which is undoubtedly one of the issues that moves me every day. Since 2014, I participate in a civil association called Kibernus, which aims to train young leaders in each of their areas of social participation. But at the beginning, it was not clear for me what was my cause. And it was until 2016, when a volunteer from Prem Rawat's foundation uh, came and talked talk to me about the peace education program, uh, which Willow described, and that represent uh, before and after for me. Taking peace as a flag, and once we realize the importance of this issue, we start events in Quintana Roo, celebrating the International Day of Peace and promoting the values of the culture of peace. We took conference to communities. We held peace speech contests with, with children. We put a peace poll in our city. And then year after year, we had held events, but the effort uh, was not enough. In a work session, we saw a video in which the International Day of Peace was established. It led us to the idea of institute, institutionalizing the Day of Peace in our state. So we present the initiative at the Congress, which after being reviewed several times, unfortunately was approved only by the majority of our congressmen. For us, uh, it continued to be something positive because these initiatives includes a call to the authorities and the civil associations to celebrate the state day for peace every September 21. In the state of Quintana Roo, we have a crime prevention model which considers the education for peace among of its main lines of action, placing the culture of peace as an element that acts positively in prevention of violence. In our state, which the, with the support of several volunteers from the Pre Prem Rawat Foundation, we have taken the peace education programs to uh, various civil society organizations, to the system for the family attention, the universities, in, in prisons of three different cities, and we have focused in public servants. They have all left a strong message about the importance of peace and its promotion. So these programs have been replicated. The next step will be to take a program to high school students, since we are convinced that in the benefits that will give us delivering the message to the job to young people, since it will allow them to know their internal tools and therefore they will be able to develop the empathy needed to bring us a change in the community. Thanks, Willow. Thank you, Alberto. And now over to you, Reverend Sabune. Thank you so much, Willow. I'm very honored to be part of this panel with my colleagues, with Roberto and Bina from India. As you heard from Willow, I've served as chaplain at Sing Sing Prison from 2004 to 2014. And during that tenure of my work, I was of course involved a lot with having peace as a central motive to my colleagues and I, Imam Mubdi, Rabbi Epstein, and others, Father Ron, and other um, chaplains. We try to instill in the men who were incarcerated at that prison 
forgiveness, reconciliation, that peace begins with each one of us. We create a place of peace with the families, with the incarcerated men, their children. In 2007, we were able to take that to the Rwanda, the country of Rwanda. We went there with Imam Mubdi, Father Ron, myself. And for three years, would go and share with the genociders in Rwanda, in the prisons. We visited 10 prisons in Rwanda and would spend there 10 days talking about peace, forgiveness, reconciliation, particularly with those who had participated in the genocide. Many of them were religious leaders, as you know. We were able to share with them and we continued that we got back to the US. That peace begins with each one of us. As the song children sing, let there be peace on earth, but let it begin with me. It begins my community. More recently, this past June, June 21st to the 26th, I led a group of young uh, people from Mount Vernon, New York. And we did a six day, 15 states pilgrimage. And we started out on our first stop at Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, where that massacre occurred. And we visited that site to talk about violence, but how we can become peacemakers. One of the leaders of that youth group, we had leaders from the congregation where I'm now since I retired. John Paul and Clement, the church in Mount Vernon where I'm serving now, part time as a retired um, pastor from Sing Sing. And the young people were led by a young man from Kitten Hall University, he's a freshman. And then four other leaders from the church. And we stopped at Pittsburgh, the first stop, Tree of Life, and talked about what caused that with the Bowers to come in and shoot those people on a Saturday morning in Tree of Life. And then we'll discuss it in the evening, how we can counter that by creating a place and a place of peace among us, among our cities, our communities. From there, we went to Louisville, Kentucky and stopped at Brianna Taylor Square where that young woman, Brianna Taylor died. And we talked about that, we talked about how we can create peace at Brianna Taylor Square with our family, with our sisters, our brothers. And from there, we went to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, where we visited the Lorraine Motel, where uh, Dr. King lost his life. Many of the young people uh, seem to remember that, but they seem somewhere they didn't know. We talked about uh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, friend of King, talked about how we can start to create peace as we stood in front of the Rain Motel, reminding them that that monk wrote to Dr. King in 1965, October, and they met October 1st, in 1966 in Chicago, and King nominated Thai, the Vietnamese monk for the Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't get it, but we talked about that. Every night we'd gather and talk about Memphis, Tennessee, and talk about a tree of life. And from there, we drove to Mother Emmanuel, Mother Emmanuel, where parishioners were killed by that young man um, who came in a Bible study and shot them after the Bible study. We talked about him. We talked to the parishioners. We made a tour of the church, Mother Emmanuel Amy Church. And from Charleston, we drove to Birmingham, Alabama, and visited the 16th Street Baptist Church where four young, young girls, four little girls, Carl Robertson, Ed May Collins, Denise McNair, Cynthia Wesley, uh, were killed in 1964, September 15. And we tell you, because these young people were about the same age, that violence, and destruction can happen in a church, at a daycare center, at a movie theater. But we, all of us, myself, my family, your family, can create a place, a sense, an atmosphere of peace 
in our communities. And from there, we went to Montgomery, Alabama, stopped at Rosa Parks bench where she stood up in the bus in 1955, went to the Justice Center uh, where um, the Justice Center, the lynching memorial talked about how society can turn upside down in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, if we are not careful. We have to work for peace every day, of every hour, every week, where we're at Sing Sing, or we're in Montgomery, Alabama, or Memphis, Tennessee, or Tree of Life Synagogue. And from there, we drove to um, Washington, D.C. We stopped at the Holocaust Museum. We stopped at African American um, Museum at the Smithsonian Institution. And also, we stopped at the Ford Theater where Lincoln lost his life. And we told the young people as we journeyed back to New York that 15 states, six days, emphasizing how important it is that we become peacemakers. No matter how young we are, how old we are, what we do, that all of us are capable of working for and bringing about peace from prisons to places of worship, whether it's in the synagogue in Pittsburgh or Christchurch in New Zealand or at a movie theater in Colorado, no matter where we are, that all of us can become peacemakers. And as I said again, my life, um, I've known violence. Of course, I'm originally from Uganda and I lost my brother, two brother and sister to the dictatorship of Idi Amin in 76, 77, 78. So it's personal, but it's also uh, professional, uh, pastoral in my role as a priest, as a pastor, that we need to remind young people every day that they can make a difference. As that in his letter to King in 1965, when uh, Thai wrote to King about peace as a Vietnamese, that King spoke about about that when he gave his speech at Riverside a year to his death in June of 1967, he quoted Thai and talked about how Thai influenced the decision to stand up for against Vietnam. So whether we're talking about Afghanistan or Vietnam or, or neighborhoods in Mount Vernon where I live, uh, we have our young people walk around the neighborhood once a month are picking up garbage and trash, making peace with ourselves or the neighborhood. And as we walk around the neighborhood, we normally talk about reduce, reuse, recycle, repair, and repent. And as we walk, people will ask us what we're doing. We say, we're picking up plastics and garbage in the neighborhood, but also we're making peace with our neighbors because they're curious. That's why we're doing this. The young people, Make it again. They think it's fun to run around uh, picking up with those uh, garbage pickups. So I believe we can make peace with our neighbors. We can make peace with our families. We can make peace as we call upon organizations to have a day of peace education, whether it's UNESCO or the UN or Pax Christi International, on whose board I served at the UN this past year, uh, in 2019, Pax International uh, at the UN that we can make peace in prison, in Rwanda, in South Africa. Professor Battle, professor of GTS, of General Theological Seminary in New York City, and I took a, a group of students to South Africa uh, last February, and we went and met uh, Desmond Tutu, the retired Archbishop of South Africa. And we took the students to emphasize that peace is not something that happens in in theory, it happens every day. But Desmond Tutu and the Dalai Lama and, and Thai and others have worked for peace and continue that we have a, an opportunity, we have an obligation to call upon uh, our leaders to make peace, make forgiveness a reality. So it's an honor, it's a privilege for me to be part of this panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much, Reverend Sabune. And thank you, well, thank you to all of us for the outstanding work that's being done, especially with young people. 
And now we will turn to uh, each person to answer the question, why, why peace education? Alberto, for you, why peace education? For me, peace is a universal value. And it, it is a value and also it can be a goal, a place or a talk. Education for peace for me is a tool that can change the world change the world for a person or generate a community change. It has been proved that in places where the violence is common, peace education programs promote values such as respect and solidarity, human rights, among others, can generate a positive change. In addition of these values, the peace education program allows you to understand which are the innate tools that each one of us has, which produce an even more profound change. Currently, in this new era that we live, derived from the COVID-19 pandemic, in which last year, a large part of the humanity was forced to remain in isolation or home for more than six months, the importance of educating for peace and the Fred Rawan Foundation program and the topics being promoted have helped many people to stay afloat. That's why we use the Zoom program to continue prom prom promoting this program. We will be working to promote education for peace to be one of the subjects in each of the schools in our state and our country. Sometimes the activities that one does, uh, the grains of sand that we continue adding are not visible in a short, short term, but we are convinced that education for peace is a vital from, for the development of young people and that tomorrow they will be reflected actions in a better country. That's why I think that is very important the peace education. Thank you, Willow, that's all. Thank you very much, Alberto. And you, Reverend Sabune, why peace education? Peace education, as my colleagues, my fellow panelists have demonstrated, peace education conference that what we need to demonstrate the positive impact of peace, particularly upon the United States Nation Sustainable Development Goals to launch a campaign for official UN Peace Day education to assemble a global network of peace, whether it's India or Mexico or South Africa or Rwanda or right here in Mount Vernon, New York. I think we need to remind each other, the young people that I took on that 15 states, six days, thousands of miles, they were exhausted when we got back, which was a good thing. You get young people tired. But the other part was that they were curious as to why did King do that? Or why did, you know, Thai do that, uh, the Buddhist monk from Vietnam? And why are we doing this? And they are back in school now. So they are talking to their friends about this week, this, this school opened. So he's back, the young man from Sydney Hall University is back and the other 15 young people that went on this trip. So we need to spread peace, person per person, neighborhood by neighborhood, nation by nation, family by family, so that we can remind people, individuals, families, communities, and nations, whether it's John Paul and Clement, the church uh, where I serve, or any neighborhood where gang violence, the, the young men I worked with, uh, during my tenure at Sing Sing Prison, there were young people who, got, who lost their way, who got involved in gang activity, who got guns before they were 12 and 13. And so the sub, there's no substitute. The, the piece is foundational. In other words, all the, we've got the sustainable development goals in the UN or look at everything we do, whether it's food or climate change or whatever we talk about, it's undergirded by peace. If there's no peace, you can't, you can't function. So that's why um, we need peace education. That's why we need uh, educa 
Association Peace Bridge Resident Conference. That's why we're doing this. Thank you, Reverend Sabunde. And from my perspective, uh, if we can agree that peace is foundational, as you were saying, Reverend Sabunde, if it's as essential to a human being as food and water, then the answer to why peace education is that so many of us human beings have become estranged from our own humanity. And peace education can put an individual, and as Alberto was saying, even a whole community in touch with themselves and help them rediscover their own humanity and inner resources. With the peace education program, because it's an empowering strength-based uh, program, it enables participants to discover their personal peace. When, when participants in the peace education program share their reflections, the individuals hear each other's perspectives and tend to realize that if I don't share you or opinions, that's all right. You're not my enemy. And these reflections lead to self-awareness, understanding, and especially the development of empathy. As you probably realize, the peace education program and these other programs that I'm hearing about are more about peace building and conflict prevention than actual conflict resolution and stopping wars. As we know from the preamble to the Constitution of UNESCO, wars begin in the minds of men. And peace education can help build the defenses of peace, of peace in the hearts and minds of people. So we've been given another question, which I find fascinating. Um, humanity is facing many challenges, climate change, refugees, war. How can peace education affect these issues? Reverend Sabune, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, refugees, climate change, um, food, insecurity, uh, pollution, you name it. Again, it's undergirded by peace. One of the programs that, um, that I cherish and I love, it was said by Larry White. Larry White served 32 years in prison in New York. He's out now, he's a Muslim, but I call him a Muslim Quaker. He works with Quakers. And Trinity Wall Street funded this program called Hope Lives for Lifers. Hope Lives for Lifers. And Hope Lives for Lifers, Reverend Ed Muller and Lara White and others, go into prisons, talk lifers about what, what is hope. So a refugee has hope. I've, I've gone to refugee camps, I've worked with refugees. And, and, and there is hope because even though you have lost everything, you have not lost your humanity. You have not lost your dignity. Yes, as we watch those hor horrific pictures of uh, that people falling off the airplane as it took off from Kabul airport, we're reminded that thousands and thousands drown every year, crossing the Mediterranean from, from Africa, try to get into Europe. They drown every year. We've stopped writing about them because it's such a, it's not news anymore. Uh, five, you know, thousands, Ground African crossing into trying to get across the Mediterranean from Spain or from or from Libya, from from Algeria, from. But whether the, our border right here, our southern border, people dying in a desert trying to cross, or whether it's the Mediterranean trying to, you know, all of us in our neighborhoods, you know, we need it. Other words, whatever it is that we're talking about, whether it's climate change or refugee policy or advocacy or immigration, no matter what it is we're talking about, if there's no peace, I have to be a peacemaker in order to participate in whether it's advocacy or peace education or hunger feeding. We feed every Friday. Uh, we have about 200 people come for food on, on, um, at our little church on 9th Avenue, Mount Vernon. 
And the amazing thing is before they come, 9.30 in the morning, they get there like 6 o'clock because they're afraid food is going to run out. So when I get there at 8 o'clock, they are lined up. And you go talk to them and they create an atmosphere of, it's not just food, but how do you feel today? How are you? Especially if it's, you know, hot or cold or you're feeling well, can I go get your raincoat? Can I get an umbrella? Those are moments that restore their humanity and my humanity. So whatever it is, whether you're in a refugee camp or, or the border, or you're talking to a child who's afraid because the gunfire going on in the neighborhood, it doesn't matter where it is, that feeling a sense of peace, of humanity, of seeing the other is what is that we have to proclaim as Larry says, hope lives for life. And we need um, to listen. Like I listen a lot more than I used to because as a pastor, as a preacher, you talk a lot. So it causes you to shut up and listen and hear the pain so you can share it. You can take it on with compassion. For all these challenges that humanity faces, education for peace allows us to connect with ourselves and understand the importance that being present in this era has a goal and education for peace promotes the integration of all as a part of humanity, being a tool to create a better world. The change comes from every, every one of us. Education for peace can be the common de denominator that can achieve the reduction of violence resuming the values that have been lost in the society that is increased, increasingly connect with electronic media, but more remote in the treatment between individuals. But I, I think that peace education can help all of us to face that challenges, Willow. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Alberto. And what I'm understanding is that whether in the street, um, on a pilgrimage or in the classroom, peace education is about restoring humanity, about moving from many different types of insecurity to resilience and making choices and decisions using the, the tool of peace, if we can call it a tool, but using the experience of peace. Um, I know that we had one inmate who had gone through the peace education program and his comment at the end was twofold. He said, if I'd known this before, when I was younger, I wouldn't have ended up in prison. And one moment of consciousness can save a lifetime of suffering. Um, I also gather from what we're all saying that it's very clear to us that changes in attitude bring about changes in behavior. Without a change in, in attitude and perception, we're not able to change our behavior. The whole perspective of someone with a lived ex living experience, a lived experience um, facilitating uh, a peace education course is yeah. seems to be particularly relevant. We've found that that in um, Brazil, with uh, a large number of homeless people, it's the homeless who need to facilitate the course. People who aren't homeless don't understand what homelessness is all about. Um, <laughs> likewise with veterans. Yeah, and I found that interesting, uh, Reverend Subunde, too, that you mentioned the, the man who was a lifer. And if I understand correctly, he was released and then started helping, um, started helping others. Would you like to add anything? Well, absolutely. I would like to uh, underscore what you said. It's absolutely correct. That, uh, Larry White, when he came out of, he's now in his 80s, so we call him grandpa now, but um, he served 32 years, and now he's out. He's helping others. He's, although he's Muslim, again, he works with Quakers at the AFS, uh, the American Friends um, 
in New York and he works on history. But um, yes, absolutely, that um, it changes his attitude. And in other words, you know, you can make a choice not to hit back, as a professor was saying, that you, you make a choice if the person um, hits me, I can make a choice not to hit them back. I can make a choice to um, go the other way. And I used to ask the guys at Sing Sing, how old were you when you got the gun? Who gave it to you? What color was it? And what did he say when he gave it to you? And they remember, they remember, the memories come back. What could you have done differently before you pulled the trigger? And we hear things like drive-by shooting and in New York and in the Bronx and Brooklyn. And I always say to the young people, there's no such a thing as drive-by because somebody picked up the gun made a decision to pick it up, put a bullet in the gun, pull the trigger, you could have made another choice when you did that. That's, you know, Larry uh, um, tries to tell young people. And I remember some of you may know one of the, Thomas Cahill is a very famous writer. He's a, he wrote a little book called A Saint on Death Row. We use that at Sing Sing a lot. And he wrote about a young man who was 19 years old in Huntsville, Texas, was on death row. And as you know, many states have the death penalty in the US, Texas, Virginia, Florida, and others. And Dominic Green, before he was um, killed, executed by the state of Texas, um, read a book by Desmond Tutu called No Future Without Forgiveness on death row. So after he read the book, he passed around uh, to all the other death row inmates, and they read the book. So they wrote to Desmond Tutu, and guess what? Desmond came to visit, uh, and the, the, he sent the, the, the digio, uh, the, the community in Rome, that uh, the digio that uh, writes to people all over the world. It, it has you know, branches here in Canada and Africa and Asia. The digio, um, came to visit him in Huntsville, Texas, before he was executed. They tried to get him. But a sent on death row talks about how young people make choices, as Professor was saying. And we need to show them other choices. I say that to the kids, young people in my church. Uh, when they talk about COVID, um, one of the young people, the young man I mentioned, who is at Sydney Hall University, his little brother had COVID at nine years old. He almost died. He had two strokes two heart attacks, was in a coma, and he came on a trip. The trip went on, he came with his brother. And we talk about the choices we make now that we've been given this opportunity to live, to breathe, to dance, to laugh, uh, to sing. That those choices, that his little brother, who is brilliant, kept saying, you know, Reverend Saburni, how are we going to do? And how, where is the war? He was, he was talking to me about Afghanistan this past he was very upset. He said, why aren't we doing that in Afghanistan? He's 10 years old now. He turned 10, August 15, on the same day that uh, we were back, you know, the evacuation started. So he'd come and say, can you tell me why that is? I said, well, his name is Jordan. And his brother is Jalen. He's 19-year-old brother. He's 10 years old. I said, well, Jay, you know, it's up to you now. Now you're 10. You're going to go up and down. And your brother's 19, he's at university, and here I am, here we are, all of us. It's about choice, Joe, Jordan, his name is Jordan, but we call him Joe. So every young person, whether it's Joe or Jalen or me or Professor or Roberto or Willow, that all of us have these opportunities to, to make peace, and whether it's in a prison or on the street or neighborhood. So... Absolutely, that you know, it, we, we have these choices. You can choose not to hit back. We can choose to teach uh, that you don't have to pick up uh, a sword or a gun. So I totally agree with the professor. Thank you, Reverend Sabune and Alberto. Please, would you like to add anything? Yes, yes, Willow. Thank you. I think that. The attitude can be a powerful element in changing our environment. We must start by being aware of ourselves that being here 
today give us an opportunity to decide what we want for our families and our communities. I have observed the scope of the peace education in places with gangs, testimonials from people who wish they had taken the program earlier. It has changed the, their life. So we want to continue with this task and bring a change for all. And, but we are clear that this change is the decision of each one of us. Yes. Thank you, Albert. I would just like to thank um, all of us on the panel for our contribution, for our rich discussion about peace education and I would even add that very often we try to teach behavior to people directly, giving them instruction. You know, you must be kind, you must say thank you. That's more like manners actually, or stop bullying, stop being violent. But through peace education, we can help people discover their own peace and inner strength to make choices that will benefit themselves and humanity. Thank you all, unless you have something um, burning that you really want to add. I think that will conclude our yeah. panel conversation. Thank me to the
In Kenya, there is an expression, peace is costly, but it's worth the expense. Our next guest, Dr. Karim Erawaki, has translated that sentiment into scholarship with detailed studies into the economics of some of humanity's greatest challenges, climate change, the oil economy, fundamentalism and terrorism, and the global drug trade. His research involves the financial underpinnings for a culture of peace. Dr. Eruaki is Professor of International Finance, Money, and Banking, and President Emeritus of the American University of Europe. The International Organization of Latino American Mayors named him their ambassador to Africa for climate change. Please welcome Dr. Karim Eruaki and thank him for his pivotal role in organizing this conference. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the Peace Education Day Forum and the outstanding work of the staff, of the technical staff who made this virtual conference a reality. This is a wonderful opportunity to share our experiences and visions of the future of the peace education in the world with distinguished scholars and politicians like my colleague, His Excellency Federico Mayor Saragossa, former Director General of UNESCO, His Excellency Brahima Kasuri Fofona, Prime Minister of Guinea, Conakry, His Excellency Stefan Manimuanju, Director General of CAFRAD, just to name few. My talk will focus today on peace education in African universities, and I will address an important problematic, which is bridging between the field and the classroom. Uh, this talk is based on my lessons and experience as a former president of the University of Kofi Annan, as a, a senior research fellow of the Culture of Peace Foundation of Federico Mayor, and as a president emeritus of the, Europe, of the American University of Europe, in Northern Macedonia. As a, a preamble, introduction to this subject, I would like to provide the, a brief understanding of the concept of peace, culture of peace, peace building, and peace education. Now, let's go from defining the meaning of uh, peace to peace, from peace, to culture of peace. As you know, peace is reference to, for life. Peace is the most precious possession of humanity. Peace is more than the end of armed conflict. Peace is a, a mode of behavior. Peace is a deep rooted commitment to the principle of liberty, justice, equality, and solidarity among all human beings. Peace is also a harmonious partnership of humankind with environment. Today, on the eve of the 21st century, peace is within our reach. We know that peace cannot be decreed slowly through treaties. It must be nurtured through the dignity, rights, and capacity of every man and woman. It is a way of being, of interacting with others, of living on this planet. Peace means also access to education, health, and essential services, especially for girls and women. It means giving every young woman and man the chance to live as they choose. It also means developing sustainably and protecting the planet's biodiversity. Back now to the concept of culture of peace. It was born over 32 years ago with UNESCO supported International Conference of Peace in Yama Sokoro in 1989 at the initiative of former Director General of UNESCO, Federico Mayor, His Excellency Federico Mayor Saragossa. The International Congress of UNESCO held in Yama Sokoro was dedicated to the theme Peace in the Mind of Man. UNESCO adopted this vision where peace is more than the end of armed conflict and where peace is behavior. The culture of peace was popularized, popularized by Professor Federico Mayor Saragossa 
it has returned to, his, to its source in the heart of Africa. UNESCO and Ivory Coast celebrated the origin of the concept that took place in Yamaskoro 32 years ago, and that has changed the way we understand peace today. It is important to recall here the Yamasokoro Declaration. Peace, it's a quotation, peace is more than the end of armed conflict. Peace is a mode of behavior. It is a deep rooted commitment to all the principles of liberty, justice, equality, and solidarity among all. This declaration echoes UNESCO's own constitution, which reminds us that since wars began in the minds of man, it is in the minds of man that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Professor Federico Mayor argued that humans cannot work for a future they cannot imagine. Therefore, the task of this Congress has been to devise visions in which all can have faith. His Excellency Federico Mayor pointed out rightly that UNESCO, by virtue of its constitution, is engaged in the cause of peace. Peace is likewise the calling of Yamasukuro. The Congress is a confirmation of the hopes of humankind. Let me recall here that the milestone of the concept of culture of peace, beginning with the proclamation in 1989 by UNESCO's member states and lending to its full adoption of the United Nations, including the high point that was undoubtedly the decade for culture of peace and nonviolence for the children of the world between 2000 and 2010. This decade was under the auspices of UNESCO, under the leadership of Excellency, uh, uh, former Director General of UNESCO, Professor Federico Mayor Saragossa. It continues now its leadership with the decade for the rapprochement of culture, 2013-2022, focused on intercultural and interreligious dialogue under the leadership of high representative of the United Nations of Alliance of Civilization and under the United Nations Secretary, under, under Secretary General Miguel Angel Moratinos. <coughs> From peace building to peace education. Allow me to recall here that the term peace building was popularized by the former United Nations Secretary General Boutros Boutros Ghali in his widely seated An Agenda for Peace published in 1992 and the supplement to the document published in 1995. In the document, Boutros Ghali called policy and academic attention to four key peace terms. Post-conflict peace building, which, which he defined as an action to identify and support structure which will tend to strengthen and solidify peace in order to avoid a relapse into conflict. Peacemaking, action to bring hostile parties to agreement. Peacekeeping, a way to help countries torn by conflict create the conditions for lasting peace. And preventive diplomacy, action aimed at preventing disputes from arising or dispute from escalating into conflict. Firstly, Bodros Ghali undertook a number of reforms at the beginning of his tenure in 1992, including reorganizing the United Nations Secretariat. He also made important reform proposals in three major reports to the Assembly, to the General Assembly, titled An Agenda for Peace, An Agenda for Development, An Agenda for Democratization. This report showed that the Secretary General's innovative thinking and they continue to influence reforms over the following decade in such area as peacekeeping. This can be said to be the principle that animated the career during the, his tenure as United Nations Secretary General, and they are developed in the agendas of the new school, New York, and His Excellency, former Director General of UNESCO, Professor Federico Mayor, Saragossa, and myself. We argue that peace, development, and democracy are intertwined and we explain what this means with reference to the three agenda Boutros Ghali presented during his mandate as the United Nations Secretary General, respectively, in 92, 94, and 96. Education is the bedrock of human transformation. As a veritable source of socialization, education has the potential to reinforce a sense of peace 
in its receiver. Higher education plays a dominant role in this direction. Over time, the capacity of tertiary institutions in Africa to empower youth for peace have been thwarted by poor educational reforms, coupled with the prevalent problems of undisciplined corruption, poor governance, shortage of resources, and political instability. Therefore, to empower youth for peaceful living will entail adopting peace education in all the facets of operation of tertiary and institution in Africa. From peace education to educating for peace, an important news between them. Educating for peace is crucial due to the normalization of violence and its influence on well-being. As a human rights student, must learn about a healthy life for everyone can be sustained without violence as a response to conflict. In peace education, lessons about the sources of and responses to conflict students analyze current problems and how they can be avoided as well as res responsibly managed. They need a vision of a peaceful future as a foundation for peacemaking and skills for constructing it. A major factor in Africa's underdevelopment is the perennial problem of violent conflict in almost all sub-region of the continent. With 16% of the world population, Africa witnessed more than half of the violent conflicts in the world in 2014. Even now, the situation is not getting significantly better. Government and the international community still invest heavily in the management of violent conflict around this, the continent. The causes and nature of this violent conflict vary from sub-region to another. In all, none of the sub-region of the continent is spared from having a peculiar problem of its own. For example, Egypt and Libya in North Africa have yet to put the negative effect of the Arab Spring behind them. In Libya, particularly, armed groups frustrated all efforts at political stabilization. The, the Mali-Algeria-Libya triangle has been turned into a terrorist hotspot by several terrorist groups, most especially Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb. In Central African Republic, Sudan, South Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, armed rebel groups what only take human lives and the problems do not seem to be abating. While the Boko Haram sect holds Nigeria ransom through its terrorist attacks, an equally sinister form of violent extremism is, perpet is perpetrated against the people in Somalia and Kenya by the Al Shabaab movement. In South Africa, there is the incessant problem of xenophobic attack on their Africans. Added to this, problems in the perennial problem of electoral violence in many parts of the continent. The intensity of this violent conflict across Africa is not as worrisome to the international community as the attack of internal capacity to deal with them. The continent is still dependent on the ever-changing mood of the frustrated international community to further develop the capacity to deal with challenges posed by violent conflict on the continent. Some efforts being directed toward preventing any further perpetuation of the present situation, but there are still huge gaps to fill through collaborative efforts. I would like here just to take one second to remind what former United States President Barack Obama tried to drum this into the ears of African leaders in the speech he delivered to Ghana's Parliament on July 11, 2011, in which he said, and Aliya, Africa's future is up to Africans. That advice is silent today. African leaders are not totally ob <clears throat> oblivious to their responsibility to deal with the challenging peace and security situation. They have several measures in place for dealing with different aspects of the problems. Now, let's move from peace education to peace building education. Teaching peace building 
what constitutes peace building education? The concept here refers to all forms of educational practice aimed at understanding, presenting, containing, and transforming conflict constructively with a view of, to creating sustainable peace in a society, whether in the present or the future. Teaching peace building in African universities. There are core academic questions important. The search for knowledge about peace building should, re should revolve around, I would say, five core questions. Why privilege peace building, rational or justification? When to do peace building, timeline or sequence? How to do peace building, method or approach? Who does peace building, agencies or actors? And so what or what to expect from peace building, the impact? Those teaching peace building must come to terms with these five questions before appreciating the gaps to be filled in their enterprise. Peace building education has three aspects, learning and knowledge, tools and skills, personal values, conviction, or disposition. It is necessary at this point to remember that there are gaps in the field and the classroom in peace building education in Africa, and then to suggest how to bridge them. Bridging the gaps. The point made above is that the teaching of peace building in Africa suffers when the field and the classroom keep their strengths apart rather than linking them. Bridging these noticeable gaps require a proactive response to the following questions to which all academic peace building programs in African University should try to respond. How do we bring the field in the class to the classroom? Add action research methodology to one's knowledge and reduce literature review only scholarship in peace building education. Be trained in skills based peace practice. Be trained in curriculum development, monitoring, and evaluation. Be trained in peace, in peace building pedagogy and organize capacity building workshop for students as a strategy to link them with practitioner. Well, how do we bring classroom to the field, share knowledge with peace practitioners, engage in development relevant research, belong to relevant association for practitioners and at the end, invite practitioners to the classroom. Well, how do we bring the field to the classroom? When uh, our first response or our response based on field work and observation to this question is to suggest that we should enroll students of the peace and conflict studies program from the field themselves as senior security officials, managers of non-governmental organization, civil servants and individual working in other critical sectors of the African continent. They will attend to as individual coming with a wealth of knowledge from the field, while many classroom teachers do not have such field-based knowledge. Now, <clears throat> again, we can use uh, the technology, the world today in the first quarter of the 21st century in which technological advances make it possible for the classroom and the field to meet, not necessarily physically, but virtually. In the modern world, technological innovation affects the way people communicate, collaborate, learn, and teach. Technology creates digital natives, digital immigrants, a 21st century school, a 21st century education, a 21st century teacher, a 21st century skills. Commenting on this, Federico Mayor has observed that with today's digital world, the classroom is not as critical as it was in a book-based learning system. Today, information stored digital, digitally can be retrieved 24 hours and seven days and 365 days. Moreover, lessons can, organize in, can originate anywhere in the world Schools will enter into agreement with research and business concern that can foster interactions with learners. To conclude, my uh, intervention today calls attention to the challenges of teaching peace building in African universities with particular focus on the gaps between the classroom and the field. For Africa to experience the much talked about sustainable peace 
there must be increased investment in peace education. How many African countries have a policy of integrating peace education into their primary, secondary, and tertiary education system as done in some other parts of the world? How many African universities offer degrees in peace studies today? How many of these universities offering peace studies are doing the right things in terms of developing and sustaining an actionable curriculum, appropriate pedagogy, and carefully considered learning resources and outcomes. As pointed Federico Mayor, Africa needs to learn some lessons from the motto of UNESCO, which says we must construct the defenses of peace in the minds of women and men. The best response to this is peace building education. In peace building education, is peace building education is the silver bullet for conflict prevention and management in Africa. We argued in our recent book on fundamentalism and terrorism, co-authored with Edward Nell and Federico Mayor, that in terms of the global motivation for people joining extremist group, schools cannot solve the problems of poverty, unemployment, and grievance, except, except at any at very long term levels, perhaps. They cannot change foreign policy. They cannot compete with the scale and sophistication of global extremist operation. But schools can try to build some resilience to extremism for young people at local levels. Peace building, education, and culture of peace would achieve the most where those promoting the academic specialization give sufficient attention to bridging the existing gaps between the field and the classroom in the specialized knowledge domain. It is hoped that the issue of this conference will contribute to this process. Chinese proverb says, if you are planning for a year, sow rice. If you are planning for a decade, plant trees. If you are planning for a lifetime, educate people. That's our philosophy at Seeds of Peace, where we educate young leaders to transform themselves to transform the world. In his many years at the United Nations, our next speaker also translated this proverb into action. Dr. Ramu Damodaran recently retired as chief of the United Nations Academic Impact Initiative, 
aligning universities with the objectives of the United Nations. Please welcome Ramu Damodaran to the first Peace Education Day conference. When the United Nations academic impact was launched in 2010, we were two thirds of the way through what we had defined as the Millennium Development Goals at the turn of the century. The principles that we set for ourselves in the academic impact comprehended those goals, but they went beyond them in substantial measure, including a particular reference to peace and conflict resolution, a particular reference to the Charter of the United Nations, and a reference to education at all levels and all forms. The wisdom of that approach in which a number of universities collaborated with us to draft the charter, if you will, of the academic impact. The wisdom was affirmed five years later when in 2015, the global community created the Sustainable Development Goals, which again went beyond development in the classic sense to areas, notably the area of peace. This year, we marked the 40th anniversary of the International Day of Peace. And it's salutary to remember that the idea for the International Day for Peace came not from politicians, not from diplomats, not from delegations of the UN, but a small gathering of scholars and researchers who met in San Jose, Costa Rica at the annual meeting of the International Association of University Presidents. It was President Yong Sik Cho of Kyunghee University in Korea who first suggested the idea which the IUP adopted the Republic of Korea was not a member of the United Nations in 1981. And so the government of Costa Rica, the host country to that meeting, took the initiative to table a resolution in the United Nations General Assembly declaring the day. I feel humbled by that because nowhere could it be clearer where the link between scholarship, the academic community, and the fundamental rationale of the very being of the United Nations, the search for peace could be demonstrated. Over the years, we found two things which to my mind are particularly salutary. The first is the development of the concept of peace education. Within a year of the meeting in San Jose, within a few months of the adoption by the General Assembly, of the idea of an International Day of Peace. An International Institute for Peace Education was set up at Columbia University in New York. And that institute continues to meet every year. Most recently, a few weeks ago, they met in Mexico at the very same time, coincidentally, that the International Association of University Presidents was holding its triennial meeting in Mexico. So these convergences, if you will, are both symbolic and substantive. They show that peace education does have what we might like to call a pedagogic context. But it would be wrong and foolhardy to try and channel it purely as a means of pedagogy. Because what peace education is seeking to do is not create a community of the teacher and the taught but a community of learners. So that everyone involved in that process, be it a student or a teacher in the classroom, is able to learn together, to listen to each other, to assimilate ideas, and to be challenged in one's own ideas. The second point which I think this day brings to mind in the context of scholarship is how affirmative the notion of peace, the idea of peace, is to every single discipline that universities and colleges teach. Because without that central core, you cannot have the freedom to explore, to work in a laboratory, to go across the borders that define and divide nations and create a truly intellectual social responsibility, which is the rationale of the United Nations academic impact. In this, we've been blessed to be supported 
by so many civil society organizations around the world who have taken up the cause of peace and been responsive to the wisdom that scholarship has brought. I would like to thank in particular a cherished friend, Bill McCarthy at the Unity Foundation, who since 1975 has been working on this idea in demonstrative ways. Bill once shared with me a quotation from an actress I have long admired, Audrey Hebben, who said, nothing is impossible. In fact, the very word impossible reads, I'm possible. And I think that is really what peace education should try and do, to prove to ourselves, to this community of learners, that we are possible, that our best motives, that our most noble impulses are not too far to reach if we can embody them and imbue our lives with them. Because in so doing, we will imbue the world around us, one community at a time, one nation at a time, and ultimately the United Nations itself. Scholarship has always chosen to be on the side of truth. And the affirmation that truth must be rooted in a world of harmony and a world that goes beyond coexistence to crow flourishing, to co-blooming, if you will, to that spirit of an engaged community rather than, as we all too often see, an enraged community, enraged by the injustices of our time, enraged by the degradation our people and planet undergo, enraged by our inability to come up with solutions because of the lack of political will. That enragement can translate to engagement and let that be our call on this International Day of Peace. Thank you. Dear Ramu Damodaran, in recognition of your decades of leadership, working with civil society and non-governmental organizations throughout the world, offering them guidance and direction in creating successful partnerships and collaborations with the United Nations, and further recognizing your leadership of the UN academic impact working with universities worldwide, makes you a central figure in the expanding peace education movement and deserving to receive the inaugural Peace Educator of the Year Award from the Peace Education Alliance of Educators and Non-Governmental Organizations participating in the first annual Peace Education Day Conference. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much, Bill. That was a complete surprise. I'm deeply touched and honored. You have always embodied what you have phrased, the power of intention. And I'm grateful that you have allowed me to join you on the journey to fulfill that. Thank you.